Hello, welcome to another episode of the Richmond Big Footy Tiger Cast. I'm your host, Michaels, and we're back after a break off from the bye, uh, with the Tigers sitting in a very good spot in the ladder. Uh, we're not going to muck around tonight because there's a bit going on currently live with the Jeremy Cameron incident, and off air we've been talking about it quite a bit, so we're going to get stuck into it straight away. Uh, our guests tonight are Grocodoc and the Lounge Lizard. Welcome to you both. Cheers, Thanks Marcus. for having me. Alright, so yeah, off air we were just talking about quite a bit the whole Jeremy Cameron incident, so we may as well get stuck straight into it because it's the hot topic of the AFL at the moment. So the latest update was that the, the they've deemed it an intentional act. Uh, so carry on, I suppose, the, the discussion of where we're at with that one, guys. How does this all sit with you, Lounge Lizard? Well, as I, as I said a few moments ago, that... Um, I'm not really genuinely a big believer in lengthy suspensions. Um, I just don't think that in the game that we have many incidents that require lengthy suspensions. But, I mean, this is one where I see the exception. I, personally, I think it's got to be eight weeks at a minimum. Um, and, I, I frankly, anything less, I think the AFL would have to appeal. I mean, let's not forget, Hawley got four weeks um, for a backhand slap uh, last year. And, um, you know, we've seen guys go for, I think uh, Grok said earlier that uh, Tom Bug got six for what was, I don't think, as bad as Barry Hall's incident, which was seven weeks. Um, so I think he's got to go for eight weeks. I mean, he left, he had his elbow up before he even left the ground. And uh, I, it just doesn't sit comfortably with me when you watch that. If his elbow's up, his eyes are off the ball, his head's turned. He clearly decided to make... Andrews uh, earn it and think twice about running in front of his flight path. Um, but this is a guy's got a history of, of poor behaviour. I mean, he was suspended only, I think, last year or the year beforehand for breaking someone's jaw in a pre-season game and among some other some other issues. And um, no, I don't believe he went out there to, to cause the damage he did, but he certainly went went to go make him earn it. And uh, he's got it wrong. And... Um, as I said, Harris Andrews has technically had a stroke, and I think for 21, 21 I think he is, year old man to uh, have had a stroke because of a nits in his workplace. Uh, I can't see how how Cameron can go for any less than eight. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a pretty savage incident, and the fact that his defence tried to come out and say that he was trying to spoil the ball, I don't buy that. Like we were saying before, um, on one hand they were arguing he was pushed into the into Andrews and on the other hand they're saying it was a spoil attempt gone wrong so which one was it it can't be both yeah no exactly and I, I think the fact that the elbow was I mean if the arm was up at the beginning like for a spoil then fine I've never seen anyone spoil with an elbow and and uh, you know um, as I said it was quite intentionally meant to make him hurt I think Grock mentioned just before that the, the ruling with the AFL this year is if the elbow is up, it's it's intentional no matter what happens. I think that's what saw Fife rubbed out only a few weeks ago. Yeah, exactly. And Grok, what, what's your take on it all? Uh, just on an update, the actual tribunal's gone uh, into the meeting to deliberate on the actual penalty now. So that's just a new update that got posted a minute ago. Um, my thoughts on it was uh, he was he, he made Harris. Andrews earn it. I mean, that's what most defenders do, uh, most forwards do if they see a defender blocking the hole, going for the intercept mark, they make them earn it. Um, at the same time, I think there was no way that he was ever going to make that contest or get a legitimate spoil in. It was always going to be an, elite, an illegal manoeuvre. It was either going to be a free kick or, you know, it was going to be a report. He was going to injure him. It was going to be one of the three. Um so I think I think in that regard it was going to be it should have been intentional and it was graded as such um, and and he was found guilty of intentional conduct. Um, my thoughts on it are I think the uh, giant repre- lawyer's representative asking for four matches. I think he's in fantasy land with that one. I don't think he's going to get more. I don't think he's going to get less than five. At, at, that's just being. That's just me being uh, underestimating it. Um, I think probably six or seven is fair. Um, I think eight is a little bit too harsh when you consider other um, sort of other incidents in the past that have copped seven, you know, seven or eight um, 
seven or eight weeks, but it's just come back that Jeremy Cameron's been suspended for five weeks. Um, the AFL were asking for six. Cameron's uh, representative was asking for four, so it looks like they've just cut it straight down the middle and gone on five. I think he's probably a little bit lucky with that five weeks. Uh, I reckon he's, I think he's very lucky. lucky. I think that should be maybe one or two weeks more than, than what he got. Um, but that that being said, that's going to rule him out until, you know, round 19 and round, uh, round 20. So that, that's a fair chunk of, of game time to miss le- leading into finals if the Giants do make it, given their form, that's no certainty for them either. So that could almost be season over for Jeremy Cameron. Um, given the, the GWS, uh, the AFL's love child, so to speak, do you reckon there's a potential of an appeal or the AFL just going to accept what was handed down given that they originally asked for six? I, th- I think I... they'll probably accept that, to be honest. Like five weeks, I think you can probably look at it and say, okay, yeah, that that's fair. Um, you can look at it and say, you know, that was a little bit too lenient and others might look at it and say that's a bit too harsh. Um, so I, I think five weeks for me personally, is a little on the light side, but I, I really can't see the AFL appealing that because f- there's really not much difference between five weeks and six weeks, to be honest. I, I mean, I think it's uh, irrelevant if the AFL wants to appeal it or not. I think it's all going to come down to the public backlash. Uh, like what, what happened with all if people come out and say five weeks isn't enough, this is bullshit, <clears throat> then you know they'll appeal it and then you know it will probably go up into the six or seven. Um, but if the public say that five is fine and they move on, then uh, I think it'll be quickly swept under the carpet. I really think it's going to come back to how do the people in the talkback radios respond to this? Because um, it's no secret that, that junior participation numbers in sport around the globe are, are dropping. And uh, they're dropping drastically in Australia with Australian rules. And... Um, it's, it's a problem, and, and, you know, if parents look at this and go, you know, it's not happening, um, then then they will appeal. I think it's going to be a big part of what they do with this. And we're talking about before how they, uh, Jeremy Cameron's defence was referencing Dylan Grimes' incident with memory. memory. Do, do we think that they set a bad precedent by not whacking memory enough of a suspension because as I sort of pointed out the only difference between the two incidents is Grimes was just lucky he didn't cop a severe injury <clears throat> compared to what um, Andrews has got do they need to sort of make sure they get all the other suspensions relevant so they can get a more accurate suspension no I don't really like as I said before looking back over um, previous uh, suspensions and stuff I mean the tribunal last year that or the um, match review panel last year that would well, a suspended memory doesn't exist anymore and it's a new system. I um I don't really like looking back over previous incidents that were held down to a different set of rules by a different set of people. I think you have to take it to a either a year by year basis or um you know actually have some proper rules written in about this stuff. You know, like if you launch up with the elbow and cause a concussion, then it is no questioning four weeks in the minimum. You can argue it to be four weeks only or it can be increased. But I think with this sort of stuff, there's got to have hard rules. You've got to be like, okay, I know if I leave with the elbow and I get the guy high um, and I don't knock him out, it's a week. But if I do, it's a minimum of four. And, uh, you know, if it's really bad like this, then they can argue down from potentially eight back to the minimum. Um, I think it'd be an easy way of dealing with this. I think it's, it's, it's the only way to go, but... No, looking back on previous incidents, incidences, uh, I isn't the way I'd approach it. Uh, what about yeah, um, it's been? Oh, you're gone. Yeah, the one thing that I really don't like is the MRO and the match review panel, the tribunal, whatever you want to call it these days. They put far too much emphasis on the actual outcome rather than the act itself, and like you can get two, you can get two identical. Um, sort of incidents, same motion, same, same everything, but if one player gets a concussion, the one player misses for two or three weeks, whereas if a player doesn't get a concussion, they miss one. And I, I think that's sort of, that shouldn't be how it gets determined because we all know clubs have forged medical reports to get get players suspended. We know Adelaide did it with us with Jake King to get him suspended uh, back in 2012 or uh, 2011 or 12, I think it was. Um it's just, 
they, they need to look at the act itself before they look at medical reports, in my opinion, um, because the medical opinion, the medical reports, um, if you read those before you actually go through the act, the you break down the incident. It's, it, it clouds the judgment. You're already going to have a preconceived notion of, okay, it led to this. You know, it's got, we're going to have to come down hard on this. It could, it could be a number of factors. I mean, you have a look. If someone did that to, um, if, if someone like uh, what Caddy did to McKay, I think, was it McKay in round two? Uh, against the Crows, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, if, if Caddy did that to someone like Paddy McCartan or, you know, um, Angus Brayshaw, who've had repeated concussion issues, he's more likely to get suspended because there's more, they're more likely to get concussed. So I think it, it sort of works um, against players in, in one regard if they look at the med- medical reports. Um, so I, I, the way I see it, I, I think they should just start looking at the acts itself and then go to the medical report once it's, it's all done to determine the actual severity rather than just go severity first and then work their way back from there. I also think what's really important too is 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 who's involved in this and um it's probably gonna open a bit of a can of worms. But I mean if this was Lindsay Thomas on uh Joel Selwood or Patrick D- Jane Dangerfield, I mean it, the media would be banging for blood after this and I spoke on the North Melbourne podcast I think a couple of years ago about this and I don't for the record think it's a racial thing. I just think that Lindsay Thomas is unliked. Um for various reasons, I don't think it's a racial thing, and I'm not trying to push that agenda at all. But I did speak on the, on on their podcast a few years ago, and and we all agreed that Lindsay Thomas is um an easy scapegoat to go for. And if Lindsay Thomas had done this with the elbow up, I mean, they would be banned for blood, and, yeah. uh, and that's clearly, I think, paid you know, going in Cameron's favour that Cameron is liked, and uh, you know what's really interesting. I think Tom Jonas got six weeks two years ago for the Hill and Gaff, and Gaff only missed one week. Uh, and we know here with Harris Andrews, he's going to miss a minimum of two. And Michael Close, the former Lions player, had a similar incident in the VFL uh, with the outcome of the bleeding on the brain, and he's been ruled out for the season. And I think what people aren't acknowledging here is, um, whilst you know Cameron's going to be free to play in five weeks, I mean, no one will actually know for at least another 14 days whether Harris Andrews can ever play again. You know, I think that's a serious yeah. element that people haven't acknowledged here is that there's no guarantee that this kid's going to get back. Um, mentally, you know, he may not have the be able to run back with the front of the ball anymore. You know, these things can scar players. And, you know, he could find himself delisted in two years' time because his his form just never recovered. Um, while, while Cameron's still one of the highest-paid earners at, at, at the Giants... Um, and Ambassador Wise won't lose a lot from these five five matches, and and that's why I think that, that, that five weeks can be very lucky. And I think if the uh, public cry like they would have been a Thomas or, or someone of that ilk, then uh, I think the NFL will, will will come down on it. As I said before, what about the instant repercussions of the incident at that point in time? So Andrews goes down, is off the ground. It's we'll call it a thug act if we want to use that term. I'm not too sure. Uh, and Cameron stays on the ground, free to keep playing. And, you know, he could kick another five goals and the Lions are without their best defender due to a, what's now been judged a deliberate act. Is there any type of way to somehow make it even, whether it's a red, not a red card system, but some kind of system like that where the player who did the act can be punished on the spot, whether that's by a review team or something like that? I don't think the umpires on the ground should be given that job because they struggle to do their normal job as it is. Um, but it just seems unfair that... You know, the the Lions are at a huge disadvantage, not only for however long he's out for now, but for that moment in time in that game as well. And it, it could happen in a finals game one day, potentially. I mean, I, I know that that's why they brought in the the double loading for grand finals to stop guys going out and smashing the shit out of the opposition. Um, however, uh, I think there's got to be a, a yellow card system. I, I Maybe not necessarily red cards, but... You know, a yellow card system where if you've done something bad, you can you're sent off for ten minutes. You can't be replaced. Now, with this incident, it would only send Cameron uh, Cameron off for ten minutes, but it'd be enough to level up for a bit. Maybe get the Lions players back in the head, and you could well have a a reviewer somewhere else who watches the incident and decides whether he's allowed to come back on or not. 
Um, I, I've been calling for a sin bin style system for for quite some time now, um, and uh, I, I think that or even a red car system could work. I mean, there's no reason why it won't work other than people say it's too much like soccer, um, or that the umpires are, as I ever put on big footy, just too shit now as it is to have that power. Um, I, I don't agree with that, and I think I think it's um, something that's probably needed in our game, and and they could well trial, I think, quite well, I easily think without too much hassle. A lot of people forget when they sort of can the idea is the red and yellow card system is done by all le- local leagues around the country, junior level, senior level, mm. the works. They all do that exact system, and it, it seems to work in well as well as it can, I guess, but. It's something I think it, it could be looked at because it's yeah it's going to cost someone or well, a team a big game one day because of it potentially. Yeah, and I don't yeah. think that. Um, um, all right, go on. But you go. Oh, I was just going to say I, I don't think that um, you know if an umpire gets an incident wrong and you sit out for ten minutes and well then he's made a mistake and it's only ten minutes. Uh, you know. Um, it's it's not the biggest deal, and uh, you know, you're right. It works. You know, it, it's pretty obvious what's going to be a yellow card incident and what's not. Um, you know, an incident like this probably could be a red. Um, but for most things, I mean, even if there's a player who's niggling someone else, has been told to stop and stop and stop, instead of giving a free kick away, send the guy for ten minutes to cool down. You know, and this is where it can be used, and this can take a lot of. Uh, sting out certain things as well. Uh, what, what I was going to say is I think they probably should adopt the uh, send-off rule, be it red card, whatever, but it should only ever be applied to situations where there's been a report, um, a player's been yeah, reported. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, that's the only way, in my opinion, that a send-off or red card rule will ever work is if it's actually been a documented incident uh, by the umpires. Um and the player should go off uh, as well um, as the uh, the send off rule go off as well if the player's injured. If it's not, if the if the um, player who's you know given away the penalty, like the injured player, or whatever, if he get if he gets up and plays the game out, fine, you know, no no big deal. But if the player actually is injured and has to go off, then send the player off because it's totally unfair that a person who's deliberately, you know, taking a player out in a illegal contest um, gets to stay on the field while his opponent misses, I think that's wrong. Um, in a situation where players... I was going to say, what would you yeah. say... What would you say if the rule was, um, if you are reported, it's an automatic yellow, and that's an automatic 20 minutes off, regardless if your player comes off or not, or the other guy in the incident? If you put yourself in a situation where you've been reported, then you come off. Um, either way, would you would you support that? Or do you think that that could be a bit too harsh? I'd probably maybe go yellow straight straight away. Give it maybe, say half an hour off, a quarter of a quarter of football off to determine whether um, the pers- the infringes uh, the infringed party actually can come back on. If the player who's who was taken out can't come back on, then show them the red because it's it's unfair for them to come back on if the player they've taken out of the game out of the game can't yeah. get back on. Um, I think it's twenty minutes to, of the concussion rule as well. I think. Yeah, it's yeah twenty minutes. Yeah. In regards to replacing a player, what I think should happen is if a if a player comes off injured and it's from a reportable off um, a reportable offence, they've been booked by the umpire. I think the team should be allowed to replace that injured player with one of the emergencies because one of their players got taken out illegally. They're down a man. I, th- I, that's, I think that's totally unfair if they can't replace them with at least another player because they're getting penalised as well. See, it's I- interesting. I'm actually quite supportive of the view of having um, six substitutes and no interchange. Um, having the, your your 18 on the field um, and then having six substitutes and, uh, you know, a situation like this where if you get sent off, you actually can't be subbed. If you're sent off, you can't be subbed on where the opposition team can sub someone on. Because um, I don't think you'd use all six in the game. 
But if your Ruckman gets sent off, then you can have a backup Ruckman. It's similar to what you're saying, but, you know, it doesn't hurt the rotations element because it's only one of, of maybe two or three changes you'll make. Yeah. All very interesting discussion points. I'm sure the AFL will discuss all that at some point down the track, and it might be something they should trial later on. But there we go, five weeks for Jeremy Cameron, and maybe a bit of a watch this space to see if it's appealed. Well, uh, we'll move on to the, the Richmond news. Well, it's not really news, but the, the review of the Round 13 game versus Geelong, which seems such a long time ago now, given we had the week off. Uh, Richmond defeated Geelong by 18 points. Uh, boys, what did you think of the game? I'll start with you, Grok. Uh, I actually watched the game uh, with some Geelong supporting uh, relatives. Very good. Um, <laughs> it's been good for you. Obviously, yeah, obviously living in Geelong, it's always nice to sort of watch the game, especially when we get up, uh, much like we did the qualifying final last year. Um, the game was very scrappy for the first three quarters, much like it was in the qualifying final last year. Um, obviously, Geelong, there was a lot of discussion going on prior to the game. A lot of people were bemused about Wiley Buzzer being a late out. Um, seeing as though in 12 of Geelong's 13 games up to that point, they've made a late change prior to the prior to the game. So I know there was a lot of sort of uh, scepticism about the actual reasoning why Buzzer was dropped. Obviously, it was a tactical thing, uh, tactical change. They would have thought the rain and the weather were going to hit, and then you get to the ga- get the game, and it's. It's reasonably clear. Obviously, there were still patches of wild weather, but I think Geelong probably screwed that one up and just shot themselves in the foot because we saw how their long bomb into the for- into the forward line worked for them, um, only having uh, Tom Hawkins down there. Um, I thought I thought the game uh, we controlled very much like what they did to us down at the Cattery last year. Um, they just kept bombing long and high, and our intercept defenders um, just just kept marking everything. Obviously, Nick Floston was absolutely amazing, uh, probably best on ground for me. Uh, Dylan Grimes was uh, very very good. Didn't get the votes on the big on the board that I reckon he probably should have. He, he'd probably be the only one on the ground that could knock Floston off as BOG for me. Um, uh, Ryan Garthwaite really looked promising. Obviously, taking um, Tom Hawkins was a big deal for a first gamer, but I think he got overawed a little bit in the first quarter, but really stood his own in the next three quarters and toweled Tomahawk up. Um, the game for me went pretty much as I expected, just grind and grind and grind for the first three quarters as it's become our MO and then blow them away in the last quarter. And Obviously, Geelong's kicking didn't really help. But I, I just think we were too good for them. Um, although they, they probably rue their midfield dominance. We got smashed again in the clearances this week. Um, and Geelong just couldn't capitalise. So I think that's one thing we really do need to work on. Yeah, I think we were pretty lucky there. We got hammered again in the clearances. That's always a big concern. But hopefully we'll address that sooner rather than later. Uh, and the lounge lizard, what about the return of Daniel Rioli? How did you see his first game back? <laughs> Yes, I was um, not sure what to make of it, and I, I really didn't know where uh, his season was going to pick up. I was a bit nervous about he'd only sort of played to two halves in the VFL. Um, having not so long ago had a, a, a foot injury um, of my own, I, I know how hard it can be to get back, albeit mine slightly worse, you could argue. Um I, I thought he stepped up and played fantastic, though. I, I've got to say, I mean, he he didn't look like he missed a beat. Um, he doesn't look as fit as you would hope he would, I mean, obviously. Um, but I think to, uh, to to step back in and, and that final play in the final quarter where he uh, intercepted the contest on the on the broadcast side on the of the offensive oh. wick there, the flank, and then down the wing and I think it was uh, I think maybe in Caddy who was involved in the play as well who at one point stopped running because he thought the ball go out and stayed in I think the one thing that's really underestimated about that play when you watch it is Jack's tap Jack, he's a deaf tap, tap into yeah. space you know and that's one thing that everyone's going on about Riolin and amazing it was but I mean Jack's done that I mean so many times now I mean I think it was even in the final against Geelong last <laughs> year that final one where um, Martin 
did the don't argue and um and Stuart and run down. I think you know Jack did a tap into someone who kicked it down to Prestia in the goal square. Um, he's such a smart footballer and he does stuff like that. And it just went to show how much we missed him when he went down early against the Saints. Yeah. Um, and how even at his age that you know a lot of people think he might retire soon. I don't think so because even once he loses his his pace, his footy smarts is so much that we'll be able to utilize yeah. him and. Um, I can see him playing quite quite deep into his career. He's not had many injury issues. He's not overly tall, or overly athletic. You know, he works the ground, but um, you know, his footy smarts are second to none, really. And uh, I, I, that that play made it for me. But I think Rioli just stepped back in very nicely. And the question is going to be: Will he burn out after a few weeks? Um, it wouldn't be surprised if he's rested a little bit more, a few games here, and a few more VFL things there. But um, no, I, I thought it was, it was a great win, and uh, I think it certainly set us up just nicely on the ladder in terms of morale. I think for with our inclusions to come, uh, the second half of the year, I'm actually still very confident in in what this season can can produce for us. Speaking of the season so far, I mean, like this is the halfway point. We're travelling, I think, a lot better than what all of us expected. To be perfectly honest, I don't think anyone thought. Or any Richmond people thought we were going to have a hangover like the Bulldogs had, but at the same time, I don't think anyone actually anticipated that we'd be sitting first in the ladder with 10 wins and three losses, um, with a, a good percentage of 135. How have you seen the season so far, Grok? Is this where you expected us to be, or did you think we were going to be sort of middle of the pack, or where how have you seen it so far? Uh, I thought uh, up till round 14, um, I had us uh, in my um, ladder predictor at this point of the season, 8 and 5. So um, we're going uh, better than I expected. Um, obviously, the the wins, uh, the losses that we had came against Adelaide in Adelaide West Coast uh, in Perth and the, the Port Adelaide game, which I felt we, we, were, we were a massive chance at winning. Um, with that one, but we just got blown away sort of towards the end there. Um, I'm, I really I'm think sure. we, we threw that poor game, to be honest. Yeah, we, we, we think probably we, that was a game we, we definitely should have won. Yeah, and so. We played disgusting that game and we still nearly won it. Yeah, and that's just, it's the same as in the Adelaide game in round two. We were we're only nine points down with 15 minutes left to go in the game. We, we were in with a massive shot at that game and then obviously... Um, Adelaide blew us out, but we we played absolutely atrociously in round two, and still almost knocked. Well, we're still in with the in, uh, in with a chance to win the game with 15 minutes left to go. So people were saying, you know, Richmond got blown out. Richmond got blown out in that game. Yeah, we got blown out, but that win doesn't say much about Adelaide, considering we played absolutely terrible and was still, you know, within two goals halfway through the last quarter. Um, so us being ten and three at the um, coming off the buyer, I think that set us up with a really good um, sort of safety net. We should finals right now should pretty much all but be locked away. Um, I'd hate I, I hate to put the moz on us, but at this point you would you'd safely assume <laughs> well, that finals. If anything happens, are on the cards. we're going to highlight this moment and play it back over and over so the whole board <laughs> knows where to come when if shit goes bad. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll find him at the Yeah, yeah, Lynch mob me. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think finals should be well and truly on the cards now. Um, so I think it's just getting through the next few weeks, trying to get legs in, legs into plays like Rioli and Prestia, and, and load up for the final run home. Uh, obviously, we've got a few games left to go at the MCG, which should help as well. Um, but I, I think this season's sort of been a massive tick, considering everyone. Like most people, tipped us to have a uh, well. Most opposition supporters tipped us to have a bulldogs like hangover, or you know, just sort of scrape into the top eight, given um, the tougher draw. But yeah, I, I'm I'm really happy with where we're sitting right now. I don't I don't think we could have asked for any more than where we are at the moment. And speaking of the run home, our run home is we've obviously got Sydney this week. Adelaide at the MCG, Giants at Spotless, St Kilda at Etihad, Collingwood at the G, Geelong at the G, Gold Coast at Metricon, Essendon at the G, and the Bulldogs at the G. Uh, Lizard, what's your realistic expectation of where we can finish based on what games we have left? 
I see no reason why we can't finish first. Um, I've been a big believer in our season this year. I, I've kind of seen, I thought after the flag that um, we, we will go the way of Geelong 2007 as opposed to the Bulldogs of 2016. Um, I think a lot went right for the Bulldogs. And, uh, you know, when you look at that Bulldogs flag, just ever so quickly, that, you know, um, their older players all had career best seasons in 30-32, um, which is credit to the club for getting them up there, but also a lot of luck, um, as well as a lot of young kids kind of having their breakout season. So a lot of things went right. And I think the reason they're rebuilding now is because when the older guys, the Morrises and Pickens and Murphy and, and Boyd dropped off, that there wasn't actually that core cool middle gap of players, um, which is why they had such a strong drop-off. Um, as opposed to us, who we, you know, I think our oldest player is... Rewalt at 29. Um, I think um, Hawley and Grigger 30. Hawley and Grigger, I mean, I, yeah, okay. And, you know, 30 is quite young in today's football world. Um, you know, so when you look at them, our, our core age of players is, is very much in the 24 to 26 bracket still. Um, we lost no key players. In fact, we lost no players at all. Um, you know, and the key guy around the club in Marriott, we kept on, you know, so... I really thought once we got the lid off the club, you know, and, and, and the weight, the ball and chain of, of Ninthman and everything the club had become, admittedly the only football club I've ever known, um, you know, it, it. I thought we could suddenly, with the, with the shackles, shackles released, absolutely go wild. And, you know, I think we've seen it not quite as dominant as John may have been in 08. Um, but still, to have only lost three games, this, you know, we may only lose three games a whole season. And then people look at us and go, oh, hang on, this is one of the, the finest seasons clubs have had. and You know, I'm more than happy for people to, to not recognise us or rate us. Um, you know, last year we were third on percentage. I think it was the, a draw, Adelaide's draw with Collingwood that, that gave them the two points to be on top. Uh, I think if it wasn't for that, that we would have been yeah, mind Yeah, massive, massive Collingwood choke where they were up by 51 points. Yes, I remember watching that, and I was um, I think I wanted Collingwood to win because I remember Adelaide were up and about where we were. But you know, I mean, we had a very, very fine season last year, and uh, there was a comment on Big Footy I read a few weeks ago, and I think it sums up where we're at this year. That last year we were playing three bad quarters, no, so three good quarters and one bad quarter. Sorry, no, yes, where this year we're playing three bad quarters and one good quarter and still winning. You know, winning's become a habit yeah. now. Um, and once it's a habit, it's very hard to break. I mean, you look at guys like McIntosh. He looks like he knows what he's doing. I know he gets slagged off a lot for his role, but he looks like he knows what he's doing. He looks confident, and he always looks like he's going to win. Um, I know that in him, he seems to embody the spirit that's around the club at the moment. Um, and we've got a very favourable run home. You know, I think we're going to yeah. go travel in the state one more time against the Gold Coast. And I GWS. think... I, yeah, and I, with the way they're going, that we should win that. And traditionally, outside of their early days, we've accounted for them. And I think when you look at Richmond now, is if we finish top of the ladder, full of steam, having only dropped a few games of the year, um, playing a home final in Melbourne with possibly 100,000 members uh, and the confidence of having not just one last year, but being primed for another one this year, I think it's going to be very hard for us. So that we would have to choke on the day and get ahead of ourselves and I, I think the club has got enough back-to-back premiership experience around the club to to know not what not to do um yeah. and I, I think if we have a strong finish to the year uh it could be a very lopsided final series for financial fans that being said yeah, it could um, also go the other way if we sort of finish the year quite limp but i don't see that happening with our with our draw yeah, there's there's pro- there's only three really crucial games for us in in our last uh, uh, nine games. I think Sydney this week, given Sydney a second on the ladder, I think that one's probably the most important game that we've got um, in the run home, uh, which is this week against against the Saints. Um, the second one it, is against Collingwood in round nineteen. Obviously, with the way the Pies are playing, that's going to be crucial you know they're sitting in the top four at the moment as well so any game against the top four contender 
is going to be crucial. And then the week after the Collingwood game, we've got Geelong again, who are going to be thereabouts as well. So I think they're probably the three main games that we should be really focusing on to try and get the win. Because if we can win all three of those, then top, we'll, we'll prob- we probably will finish top two. And I think and if, I, we I... Finish top, if we finish top two, you, um, a, a, the flag's going to be a very real possibility because we're, we're not going to leave Melbourne if that's the case. I get goosebumps no. just thinking about that possibility. Just... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's funny. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be overseas sort of during the end of the season, start of the finals, and I've deliberately actually made sure I fly back um, two or three days before the grand final because I'm actually that confident we're going to make it. Wow. Um you know, and, and I, I just see, I mean, we don't have injuries. And, I mean, everyone goes on and on about injuries. And if there's any sort of neutral fans who are listening to this, you know, we haven't had a lot of injuries, but we have. Over the last couple of years, we have had guys miss. Um, but another reason we haven't is we've got an exceptional fitness department inside the club. Um, you know, we've avoided soft tissue. And, and that's the credit to the people doing their job. Um, I think, you know, the injuries we've really had are some 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 sort of unlucky ones. I think Jack got a poke in the eye last year. Uh, yeah, obviously, Rioli sport press. Yeah, Presti's injuries pre-existing. Um, you know, and, and I've got a lot of faith in the fitness stuff. That you know, I mean, look at the way we're just running out games now. I think a lot of that is a mental thing. Clubs and players will think, shit. We know if it's close at three quarter time that this is what they do, and we're going to be thinking this is what we do. Um. And a lot of it's the fact that I think we are actually genuinely a very fit side. The um, the whole Richmond don't have injuries thing, I think, is a load of bollocks. Um, we do have injuries. The only difference is our injuries are only one or two weeks. They're not the full long-term injuries. So it, it, it all credit goes to our, our medical and fitness staff because their, their player management um, strategies and everything are probably the best in the AFL at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I agree. Way, we're, we're in a good spot. It'd be interesting to see what how the guys would respond if they were to finish first, as opposed to um, finishing a bit lower on the ladder. Because I think it's a whole different ball game if you're the top team when it goes into the final series. But I think what you said before, Lizard's right that having the the monkey off the back and going through what we did last year, I think they're in a better mental space. And if we manage to secure home finals, we're going to be in a good, very good position to have another crack at it. Which would just be plus we're going to be experience. lucky as well. Looking at possible matchups, should we make the grand final? I mean, Geelong, it's been you know uh, seven years since their last grand final, and I'd be surprised if many players in their best twenty-two or squad actually have grand final experience these days. And they have known have a bit of a tagline recently of choking, so they will be very nervous on the big stage. You know, two prelims they've lost. Um, Adelaide, obviously, we're not going to play. Port um, also have had a bit of a history of choking since the prelim. Collingwood would have uh, very little to no grand final experience. Um, and Sydney, as we know, you know, uh, two heartbreaking losses recently, and they make it third in consecutive, you know, doubling years, and they'll be very nervous coming up against, you know, uh, Richmond and Melbourne, who, who will be confident on the big stage and play in front of. 95,000 plus often enough that I don't think it's actually gets to the players. I think it's been one of our greatest strengths over the last couple of years is the big blockbusters that the players are used to that crowd. Um, so there's going to be a lot of teams with a lot more to lose than we do if we come on grand final day. And and, and, and they, they could choke and bottle it for that reason. And I think we're very lucky that we're not um, potentially playing at a, a Hawthorne or a... Um, you know, a Sydney of a couple of years ago, perhaps, or even the Bulldogs who who won one and riding the emotion, um, or an Adelaide hell bent for revenge. Um, the, whoever we play, I think there's a lot more things that are going to go in our favour just on the experience of it. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. I hope you're right. I really do. Like I said, I was getting goosebumps even <laughs> just thinking about the fact of potentially being there again. And um. I'll quite happily leave think... my two or three week old son home whenever he's born to go to the <laughs> finals. <laughs> I've already made that decision if it comes down to it. What do you think it would say in Richmond's history um, when people look back on Hardwick, who took over? I think Rock and I spoke about this recently, actually, over a beer, but um, you know, took over what was deemed the worst list and worst since Fitzroy. Club with no money, broke, 
did his best to rebuild, wasn't really taken by the fans, had some bad decisions, nearly got sacked. And then if he ended up a, a, a two-time premiership coach, it would be just a remarkable turnaround. And um, it, it's fascinating to think that 18 months ago, I, I didn't think Arbuck would have a job, let alone be a, you know, a uh, premiership coach. I think it'd be really interesting to see how, how he's remembered in Richmond history. I think um, just the fact that he's got the one flag, he's going to go down as a, as a legend, given that after 2016, you would safely say that 90% of the supporter base kind of figured he'd be out the door by the bye, given the form we had. Yeah. Um, and to turn it around just that instant and to own up and admit his mistakes and make all those changes, it's just been a phenomenal thing to do. I think he'll probably end up being seen by Richmond supporters the same way that Bomber Thompson seen by Geelong supporters, you know, took over a club uh, that was sort of uh, in the doldrums, was thereabouts, you know, hadn't really had any any success for, you know, a number of decades. Um, got Had a bit of a bad run with injury and, you know, bad luck heading into 2005-2006. And then almost almost got sacked. Uh, Frank Costa came out and said, stick by Thompson. And then we all know what happened in 2007. So I think uh, from from that standpoint, I reckon we could probably say dinner is Richmond's version of what Bomber Thompson is to the Cats. And I think it would be interesting in that regard too that by Thompson's sort of ninth or tenth year was quite clearly burnt out with the job. Um, yeah. And, of course, you know, hard week now in the similar time frame, it's, put so many hard yards in that now he's at the premiership window. You know, it's going to be interesting whether he burns out and that, how the club sort of goes, you know, we win a flag this year. And then he sort of says, you know, like two flags and, you know, I've got a young family, you know, that's kind of it for me. How, how they transition and what, what placements they're putting in and how long we feasibly think he can coach, whether he sees himself as a career coach or, you know, whether – whether he, he's achieved that that goal he set out to achieve, it's going to be interesting, you know, um, what he seems to do. And I've never really heard him publicly speak about whether he's a career coach or, or um, you know, how seriously he takes it. So, well, hopefully, we can get there and all find out those answers in the near future. We'll uh, have a look at the the big game this week. Is to to get to that last day in September, we have to get through a few more games yet. And up this week, we've got the Sydney Swans on Thursday night. Uh, first of all, I just want to make note of the fact that I think it's complete crap that we're playing them at Etihad Stadium. Granted, I understand Agreed. that we we have to play our one home game at Etihad. That's fine. I, I get that. But we this year at the MCG, we've played Brisbane, Fremantle, and the Bulldogs are coming up. Surely one of those games would have been better off being an Etihad game as opposed to Sydney, who have quite a big supporter base down in Melbourne. That That's my reasoning for that uh, game being at the MCG. Sydney, we all know, have a very strong supporter base in Melbourne. They're, they're the only, si- only interstate side outside of Victoria that has a very strong following um, so in, in Victoria, so I think us playing them at, at Etihad is uh, complete bull crap. As as you mentioned, Michaels, it probably should have been Brisbane or Frio that we played at Etihad. Most likely Brisbane, uh, in my in my opinion, because Brisbane don't really draw much of a crowd anywhere they go yeah. uh, these days. Whereas Frio, Frio do have a, a relatively decent um, contingent of travelling supporters, so. I probably would have swapped the Brisbane game and the Sydney game um, at the grounds that they were played at, to be honest. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, with that aside, it's first versus second. Um, I don't think we've, we've ever played each other before when both teams have been in first or second position. So a bit of a unique spot. And like we sort of said before, this game's going to really sort of define either one of our team's seasons, I guess. Uh, Lounge, what are you looking forward to with this game? How do you see it panning out? I am... Um... I think we'll win this, but I think what's going to be a great matchup is that I saw a statistic. Um, I think it may have been on 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 the radio that Sydney actually um, statistically will bring you down to their level. They're actually sort of a team that they don't rise and match sides. They can grind sides down, and they play a very not as contested as it was ten years ago. But people still remember that, but they do play a contested game. Um, with that slingshot game, which is very different to what we do. And we need to be aware that 
odds say that Sydney are going to bring us down to a contested game, which, as Grok alluded to earlier, we struggle with against the Cats, I think we have this year. So getting Prestia back in, which I believe he should be, will be a massive inclusion. Yeah, Jim, uh, Jim uh, said in his press conference uh, this morning that Prestia is 100% starting on Thursday night. So Yeah, and no, that's very important because on a, on a dry track, uh, the Eddie had is losing, and a small ground really, losing the contested thing in the middle um, with their slingshot footy. Last thing we need is, is uh, Parker or um, Kennedy getting the football and bombing it down to Franklin, um, you know, in, in a, before our, our, you know, our defence has got time to structure because we don't play well to a very quick bomb in. Um, we like to let the, the side set up and then if you watch, we all drift across and follow the ball carrier. Uh, the quick entries, we don't, we don't defend very well. You know, we want to take their time so, Rounds can get loose. And, and that's been a and, huge concern because we've conceded so many easy, quick inside 50s in the last month. It's actually amazing we haven't conceded more goals and probably a credit to our defence that they haven't conceded more goals because we're getting slaughtered in there. Yeah, and it's been... Um, I've, I watched quite interestingly... Uh, it was the Anzac Eve game. I was up with a friend. I'm actually sat relatively high in the, in the stands. and If you watch from a higher angle, um, the way the players zone across the ground um, is very much in diagonal running in line, sort of 15 metres apart from each other. And that's when we do our best work, when we sort of literally press the whole ground up, which is why I find it so amusing that we can do it on the MCG better than anywhere else. Um, so, yeah, if, if we, if Sydney don't, if we don't, Sydney don't let us play that game and they play a very contested, quick bombing slingshot game of football, I still think we will win, but I think it, it, we're going to be under a lot of pressure. But if we can get our game on top, which would be the statistical anomaly, admittedly, um, or match with them contestedly, which is probably the biggest deal, then I think we're probably more likely to win a bit more comfortably. I, I think it's either going to be a 35-40 point win um, or you're looking to the 12-18 to 18 point margin. And Grok, what about some of the matchups yeah. we've got going? There's Rance versus Franklin, Rewalt versus Rampy. It's going to be pretty good battles all over the ground. Yeah, they will. Just on um, what um, Lance Lizard was saying about the midfield battle, the only reason that I'm not worried about the midfield battle against the Swans is their midfield is very one-paced apart from Zach Jones. They don't really have anyone who breaks the lines. I mean, Josh Kennedy isn't quick. He relies on his size and and his strength. Hannah Bruce not exactly quick. Kieran Jack's not quick. Luke Parker has has a bit of toe, but he's, he's not a super speedster. Whereas, I mean, you have a look at Geelong. They've got Dangerfield, who's explosive. They've got Tim Kelly, who's you know quick as lightning. Port Adelaide, they have you know Jared Pollock. That you know these these players have got real speedsters. Um, go with them. So, I, I don't against Sydney. I think our mid our midfield will be a lot better matched, especially players like Jack Graham, who aren't exactly quick obviously Dion Prestia as well he's not exactly quick either so I think the midfield battle for us is probably going to be a little bit easier than what it has been over the last sort of month still um, got just, just based and on Garrett the, the speed pretty quick. and Hewitt too who yeah. go through there but they're, they're, they're sort of yeah they're sort of the outside mids they're, they're the ones that get, that get the ball so I think the clearance battle for us will probably be a little bit easier um, sort of the, the players we're coming up against. The biggest one for me is obviously Josh Kennedy. Um, he's the main one who, who gets the ball there. Uh, in in uh, terms of matchups, um, obviously you've got Rance, uh, who's due to give Buddy his annual um, shower. Um, obviously he's going to... Uh, Rance on Buddy is always a great battle. Um, it, it has been for near on a decade now. You know, Rance uh, on Buddy's always been entertaining to watch. Um, one always seems to get a hold of the other for a half of football and then the other kicks in. So there's really no true dominance either way. I remember the game a couple of years ago where Buddy kicked five and people were still saying Rams had the best of Buddy. So it, it just shows you the quality of the battles there. Um, obviously, Heath Grundy on Jack Revolt, that's, that's going to be um, that's, that's gonna be a given. Um, I think, obviously, if that's going to happen, Jack's going to have to get on his bike because we know Grundy 
it uh, much prefers to be one on one in a in a strength contest than having to get on his black because we know he's not exactly a spring chicken and and doesn't really have the athleticism to go with the more mobile forwards. So obviously that if Jack gets up and, and starts playing up around the half forward line and pushing up, that, that's really going to expose Grundy. Um, the, the main one for us that we need to shut down personally is Jake Lloyd. He sets Sydney up so well from half back. He's often their distributor, uh, getting 30, 35 possessions from half back, and his field kicking is is probably one of the best field kicks in the AFL. So obviously if we can get uh, maybe Daniel Rioli or even Jacob Townsend to come in just to sort of man up on um, and Lloyd make him accountable, you know, just just have a real physical presence on him, I think that's really going to set us up as well. I think we have to be very careful of Callum Sinclair as well. Um, he's, yeah. in, he's having a, a fantastic season, and so is Nank for the record. But when we, there's an interesting um, thread that Serge had put up uh, uh, that pointing out that Grigg isn't contesting in the ruck the same way that they were treating him as undersized ruckmen, and now they're not. Um, and when we rotate Nank off, if Grigg is going into the ruck, um, he's going to get soundly beaten by Sinclair. And I think we've got to be really careful that Sinclair doesn't. Have a have a day out um, when when Nank is resting. It's uh, going to be interesting battles all, all over the ground. And the other one, I mean, you said before that Prestia is probably likely to come back in, as Dimas said, and that might mean that Caddy gets to play forward a bit more, which is probably where he's most dangerous. So that gives us another a tall avenue as well to maybe help keep Rampy accountable as well, because he loves to intercept Mark. So that's probably going to be a very vital inclusion for us. Obviously, Asprey back to helps. And there's an interesting stat that if Prestia and Asprey come in for Garthwaite and Higgins, that's just an assumption, that we would only be two players away with Basha Hawley and Townsend from having our entire premiership team back together playing for the first time since the grand final. <clears throat> and that, that's never been done in the history of the AFL. Yeah, which no, is no, fascinating. That's won the premiership. Yeah, yeah no team that's and actually would... won the premiership has ever fielded that same team again together. No, and I wouldn't be surprised if Townsend comes in this week as well, and uh, we're only the Hawley injury away. Um, but I suppose, of course, yeah. I, I don't see Short being dislodged somehow. No, but, God, um, no, he's been really good. But that whole um, premiership team not playing together, I suppose that sort of makes sense when you think that Richmond is the only club in uh, VFL, AFL history that's never made any list changes to their premiership side for the following season. We didn't lose players. you know. That I didn't know that. that. I think, yeah, we're the only club that's ever done that that wow. hasn't made okay. uh, things. At least that's what I was reading somewhere on the Herald Sun a few weeks ago. So it's another little factoid. Jeez, this is your first mistake was reading the Herald Sun, though, wasn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. So probably probably a steaming pie. Is that all you get? Out. Is that all you get out? Cry away. Yep. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Just while we're talking about individual players, a shout out to Sean Hampson, who has announced his retirement today, effective immediately, just obviously struggling to overcome the back injury. Uh, I know he obviously didn't play a lot of games for us, but the games he did play, he, he left, he put everything out into the field. He played with obvious injuries time and time again, but just refused to come off and did his, his best to help the team out. So thank you, Sean, for your services, and hopefully you can get your back right because your the rest of your life with your kids and family is much more important than any kind of football career. Exactly. Yeah, no, agree completely. I think he's been much maligned on the board. Um, he's probably our only shining light 2016, which admittedly may say more about that season. Um <laughs> than anything but yeah I think uh, he's been a great servant and, and he's done well for yeah. 35 games now jumper he's uh, picked up a very beautiful yeah. wife and a good bank account so I wish to be him <laughs> yeah and you know I, I you think... only have to look at um, Ivan Marek when he made his retirement in his speech he was pretty emotional when talking about Hampson so he's obviously had a very big impact around the club um, behind the scenes that a lot of us wouldn't know about so he's obviously much loved as a clubman, um, yeah, and he, he gave his mm, best for us. Put something up very similar. Yeah, yeah. I, I think 
I think a lot of people forget just how good Hammer was in 2016. Obviously, we all know his limitations. He wasn't the best, you know, contested mark. He wasn't the greatest kick or, or skill-wise. But um, one thing you, can, you, you can't fault about him was his effort and endeavour was absolutely incredible. Um, his ruck work was really, really good. It's probably the best tap ruckman we've seen at Punt Road for quite some time. Um, but I, th- I think 2016, he really managed to work on his deficiencies. He was getting back, uh, he was floating down back, taking contested marks, helping out, you know, rants and that down back. So I, I think, you know, people who were shit canning him on the board just need to realise just, just how good he actually was for us in the short, short amount of time he actually, he actually played for us. So, and let's not forget, um, it was an emergency in last year's grand final. I mean, of all the yeah. players we could have picked in the three spots, I mean, he was one of them. I think that says enough of, of you know, he, he was coming good, I think, before the setback in the preseason. Yeah, agree. Definitely agree. And it's just one of those what could have been. I mean, we always, I mean, I in particular always scream out that we need to give Nank a bit of a trop out, and he would have been the perfect guy to do that um, with his experience and his, his ruck work. But we'll never get to see it, unfortunately. But either way, we wish Sean all the best in what he, whatever he does in life after football. Agreed. All right, before we wrap yep. up, we'll get a, a tip from you both for this week's game on Thursday. So, Grok, I'll start with you. What's your tip, including margin? Uh, my tip is Richmond by 17 points. I think it's going to be a pretty close game. Uh, won't get too much of a blowout either way, I think. Uh, I don't think, but, um, yeah, I, I just think we'll probably grind them out in the end, sort of like we did to Geelong. And Land Lizard? My tip is that Grok's going to hit the uh, Carlton Dry something chronic and roll down to the local cryo RSL <laughs> and uh, just do his, his finest work material. Um, That's an unbackable failure, yeah. isn't it? I, yeah, it's I'll, like I'll, caviar odds. Put your house on it. <laughs> well, I've, I've, been put put, house I've been put off red wine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I've yes, not, um, not even asked if, about that story yet. I, I thought about it, if, but I thought, no, I'll let it go. <laughs> it is, it is. I think, becoming folklore uh, within the site. We'll um, have to get the three of you on one but, day to give us a bit of a recount of what happened. There is. I'll flick across a image of me that morning uh, to you, maybe not onto the board. Uh, yeah. So I might flick across. Um, but no, if anyone's curious... Uh, if you're looking to not eat all day and then drink too much, uh, do it at Terra Tiger's house. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing this photo then. Um, and, oh, what, what was your tip? I think we got a bit sidetracked there. What was your tip for the game? Besides oh, actually, Brock I, getting I, on it? I, I think Richmond by by uh, 25 plus. Yeah, I reckon I'm with Grok. I reckon it's going to be close. Also, Richmond between somewhere between 12 and 15 points. But I think it's going to be a cracker game either way. And as much as I hate Thursday night games, I'm glad we're a bit earlier this week than the Sundays we've been getting the last few games. So, uh, Grok and Doc, the Lounge Lizard, thanks so just, much for coming on, guys. Yeah. Are you going so, to go? just just before we go, Michaels? Um, I have a quick roast if that's all right. Oh yeah, okay. Just yeah, um, I'd just like to roast the AFL umpiring department. Um, obviously, with uh, the uh, sort of uproar there was about uh, umpiring uh, West Coast games in Perth, uh, how does the AFL rectify that situation? Uh, they schedule three Western Australian umpires to officiate the West Coast Essendon game at Optus Stadium. The, the free kick count at half time was actually 17 to 9. At the end of the game, the free kick count was 33 to 17. So West Coast in the second half of that game got almost as many frees for that for the second half that Essendon got in the uh, got for the whole game. So I, I think they 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 played that pretty poorly. So that, that that's pretty much my roast. I think that they did a pretty shit house job of sort of dispelling any sort of criticism that they, that was directed their way. Yeah, I, even watching that game, I think I said to someone that Essendon fans would have every right to be ropeable about the uh, the umpiring in that game, despite winning it. It was disgusting. Yep. Oh, did you have a mini roast while we are at it, uh, Lounge? Was there anything you wanted to add in the way of roasting? No, I mean, I, I, I was originally going to roast the um, AFL on the Cameron incident, um, had the news come through a bit later. But we've we've covered that, so I give a bit of a toast to wrap up on a light note. Um, 
you know, I, I think the toast goes out to all of the members who signed up this year. I mean, 95,000 is a remarkable number and, uh, and it's still growing. And, uh, you know, one thing we're not as bandwagons and, uh, so I think we had 80,000, I think at last year before we even looked like winning a flag. So it's, it's been remarkable. And I think Dovin has paid off. It's, um, it's just great to see. I mean, the fact that we're just, you know, in the strongest position we can be. And I think really pushing Collingwood is undoubtedly the biggest club in Australia. Absolutely. And hopefully with any luck, we can crack the 100,000 this year, which would be an exceptional effort. So if you haven't signed up yet, make sure you do and uh, join the Tiger family in an official capacity and, you know, become... An That's richmondfc.com.au forward slash membership is where you want to head to. That's it. Uh, absolutely. Oh, I'll say our stick, but we haven't seen him since Grand Final. Who's that? He hasn't been on since no. December. Yeah, uh, no. Yeah, yeah he hasn't been on since December 5th or 7th or something. No, I think there's bigger fish to fry now than us, unfortunately. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's all right. It's understandable after winning a flag. I'm sure there's a lot of other things going on, but hopefully we get an official yeah. back on the board at some point because I thought that was quite good interaction. But um, yeah, regardless, if you're not a member yeah. yet, sign up and help us get to 100,000 just to really jam it up the uh, opposition supporters' nose because they would not be happy with that at all. Collingwood. <laughs> the salt would be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, well, uh, yes, Grokodok and the Loungers, thanks so much, guys, for coming on and for jumping straight into the Jeremy Cameron discussion. No, that was a bit, uh, well, it wasn't really on the agenda as such, but it was a hot topic and it deserved to be spoken about. And we'll see uh, see what happens with the five weeks. But yeah, thanks again for your time, guys. Thanks, Jeremy, Michael. Thank you for having me. Grok. And until next time, go Tigers. Go Tigers. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Richmond Big Footy Tiger Cast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and YouTube so you can follow all the roasts and toasts, the reviews and previews, and all topics Richmond. Also keep an ear out for our special episodes of interviews with past players. Go Tigers!